background and some technical expertise that I needed to be able to take care of any problems that arose during the fermentation process, although knocking on wood, so far that hasn't happened. You know, we, we've been pretty lucky. Um, things have been just right every year. Our wines change every year based on the vintage, just like they're supposed to. And we are not um, a chain restaurant that makes everything the same every day, you know, year to year from big location to location. So that's how we got started. 2009 turned out to be a great year. I bought more grapes than I had business buying. Ended up um, making about 100 cases of wine. I had four barrels. Um, had no idea what, what was that was like one ton? Look, about a ton and a half is where we ended up. Because I bought, you know, high mountain fruit, diamond mountain, almost at the very top. Um, and it was an old vineyard, uh, full of leaf roll. The, the yields were low. The maturation was slow. Um, really perfect for my style. Uh, so, you know, sort of that restrained, elegant, sophisticated style as opposed to the big, you know, beach over the head with a, with a bunch of grapes sort of stuff. Um, so we, uh, I ended up with 100 cases of wine. I had no idea what I was going to do with it. I mean, I thought I got a really great price at $6,500 a ton. Little did I know that was like almost double the Napa Valley average that year. But it was Diamond Mountain, was Diamond top Mountain of Green. the mountain. It was Rudy von Strasser. It was all great stuff, all the good stuff. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I thought I was getting a hell of a deal, which I was. I mean, basically I was Considering getting... Considering who, who grew it and where it was grown. All that good stuff. It, was, it turned out to be an incredible wine. Um, had some friends come up from out of state visiting, sat them down for dinner. You know, they said, hey, you know, so you've been making wine, we hear, through the grapevine, no pun intended. And that's, they said, well, let's drink some. So we did, and they liked it. And they walked away with a few cases of it. I thought, well, damn, this is gonna be a commercial success. And it was, it sold out in about uh, 90 days, all 100 cases of it, except what I kept for myself, which was actually a pretty large stash because at that point, I drank through my entire, you know, collection of wines, and the only wines I had were my wines, and I drank it every day, which is, you know, again, it's one of the, to me, that's one of the, uh, I guess, the best ways to, to describe a good wine is something that you don't mind drinking every day. You know, if you, if you drink some wines that are huge, big bottles of wine that you only drink on a special occasion, not because they're so expensive, but because they are so big, and they are so strong, and they are so powerful, that you can't drink them on a daily basis. I like to drink every day, or be able to drink. I don't drink every day, but I like to be able to drink every day. Right? So, how about the fermentation on the 2009? Was that like all wild yeast fermented? Or? No. That's kind of a, no. You'd like to say it was all natural yeast, all came out of the vineyard, but the reality uh, is if you want to make sure something's going to go to fermentation, I think that the only way to honestly do that is to throw some yeast in there and make sure that you do get fermentation. I, I put every penny I had into that, and for me to run the risk that you know, I'd get a stuck fermentation wasn't worth it. So, you know, we use some good Bordeaux-style yeasts. Um, it, goes fermentation, it fermented all the way out. It was in the barrel for three years, all French oak barrels. About 30% of them were new. Uh, I've stayed with that kind of barrel regimen ever since. I use all French oak barrels. Um, I move it to neutral barrels, and it stays in neutral barrels for a long time. Um, just like the French. I mean, those guys are pretty dollar sensitive, and they use a lot of neutral oak because it's cheap. <laughs> and it's you, know, you can use a barrel for a long, long time if you just take care of it. So that's what we do. How you, so if you look out into the, your winery right now, the oldest barrel sitting out there getting ready to be reused, maybe six or seven years old? I have, a, I have a couple of 07s out there. Yeah. Um, but I'm actually getting ready to trade those out. Um, I'm getting ready to trade those out. Uh, got a couple of. You have a recoup too. 
Well, but uh, yeah, I do have them re, re, recoupered, which helps a lot. That remanufactures them to where they're ostensibly a year to two year old barrel. So they got grind the inside. They down go in and they actually shave all the. They shave it down. They will shave it down almost till almost brand new wood, um, because the the wine seeps in maybe a quarter of an inch deep. So they'll shave that quarter of an inch off. Yeah. And then retoast it. So they start with pretty fresh wood, not brand new wood, pretty fresh mm. wood. The stave gets a little thinner. Right. Do you um, have a favorite cooper for renewing your used barrels? Um, you know, I like the Terenso barrels. Terenso seems to, to give us a good flavor. Um, Segui Moreau is some nice little barrels. Um, I've got some, let's see, out there I've got some, oh God, who else I have? I have a lot of Segui Moreau and I have some Terenso's. Mostly that's what I've got, is Terenso's mm -hmm. and Segui Moreau's. I want to be sure to take a snapshot of some of the, the, the old barrels. I <laughs> think you can do there. that. There's, they're all out there. Yeah. So um, that's kind of that's kind of you know where we are. We've upped our production to where we're at about 350 cases a year now, and that's that's this year's 2012's production. 2013 is uh, you know we've got 400 and some odd cases. Yeah. 2014 is a little bit more than that. So we're increasing every year. Luckily, we've been able to sell out every year. We're allocated to our retail clients. Uh, we're allocated to a couple of wholesale accounts. Um, we're 100% allocated. Um, we try to produce a little bit more each year so that we can uh, get some new clients. Um, but we try not to overproduce and we try not to underproduce. Right. So okay. it's a it's a controlled growth. I mean, there's a there's a definite arc to it. Right. So we're on track to go up. We go about 20, 25% a year increase which is good. Mm -hmm. So far that's been working out for us. Yeah. You told me that you're looking forward to targeting some special restaurants in the uh, Mississippi Valley region, sort of, in the New Orleans and Dallas. And well, there's a, there's a profile of restaurants that these wines work really well in. That's, a lot of it are, are the, I mean, honestly, they're, they're great food wines with any kind of food, but they tend to be, uh, you know, that, that steakhouse type of yeah, wine. Steakhouse. It's a really good steakhouse type of wine. Yeah. Go to Brennan's in Houston. Brennan's in Houston. Uh, you know, obviously you've got all the Smith and Walensky's, the Valone Steakhouse. You've got all those guys. You've got Morton's. You know, those are the kind of guys that are, um, that this kind of wine works really, really well in. But um, get it in Peter Luger's in Brooklyn would be nice. But that's that's definitely a reach. In Brooklyn? Yeah. Um, you know Peter Luger's, right? No, I haven't been to New York City. Well, for Peter long Luger's time. is like an incredibly famous steakhouse in New York. And it's actually in Brooklyn. Um, my my son just went to uh, back east for a wedding, and he's going to stay at a friend's apartment in the uh, in. In Brooklyn, in the, what's the nice neighborhood in Brooklyn? The famous neighborhood in Brooklyn these days? Dude, you have, I have no earthly idea. Yeah. But anyway, he's like a steakhouse, not so I mentioned. Well, it's, the, it's one Peter, of those things. Peter that, Luger's is, yeah. is a good one. When's he going back? He left last night. How long is he going to be there? And he, I think next Tuesday he's going to New York City for a few days and he's staying in, in Brooklyn. So I'll say Peter Luger's. Well, he's SOL because it's about a three month wait to get on to get a reservation unless you're somebody special, I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, we'll but he should that. at least go check it out. Yeah. They dry age all their meat there on site. I mean the the waiters have been there for thirty years. I mean it's it's an institution. It's literally an institution. And he should go by there. I've I've never been. I've always wanted to go, but I've never been. It's always one of those things yeah. I always Number one, it's it's expensive as hell. Yeah. I mean, a steak is a hundred bucks. Right. Which is a lot of money. Yeah. And then, the then you get all your sides yeah. and then you get wine and you're, I mean, you're, it's like the French there. laundry. It's like yeah. going to the French laundry, but yeah. you go to a steakhouse, right? You come out clean. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Completely clean. Wallet, pockets, yeah. everything. Yeah. Yes, sir. It's all gone. Uh, I think in the neighborhood that he's going to, I think it's called Williamsburg. Oh, yeah. Williamsburg. Of course. Right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Williamsburg is a hot area for sure. 
it's definitely become gentrified. So, you know, it's more people, less space, they have to move somewhere. Right. So families, a lot of families out in that area. So it is definitely gentrified. A lot more amenities out there than there used to be. So now you've just gone through a, a couple of weeks of bottling and labeling these all these different vintages of your different wines. Yes, we have. We have one left to bottle, which is our Sauvignon Blanc, which we'll bottle this weekend. Yeah. But we went through the big bottling, so left and the right bank, each about yeah. 100 cases. Yeah. And the reserve, which is, we're holding the reserves down to about 50 cases, trying to yeah. keep that level. Um, it is a different wine, it's a special wine, and I basically pull a couple of barrels out every year, the, my favorite barrels, and set those aside, rebarrel them into a newer barrel, and let them sit for an extra year. Um, so, it, the, so the blend that's in the reserve has been in a barrel for how long? Four Three bottles? years. Three years? Yeah. So you're doing your, your blending pre-fermentation? Nope. Oh, no. I blend pre-bottling. I oh, blend oh. literally... What happened to us this year was interesting. Yeah. Uh, we, did, we do several blending sessions, kind of, you know, ramping up to the bottling. And we so, you know, play, play around with the percentages, pipettes and graduated cylinders. And we lay it out on the table and we have lots of glasses and lots of bottles, sample bottles and lots of... It's like a science lab. Yeah, it kind of looks like chemistry 101 in high school. And we come up with what we think the blend's going to be. And um, we get pretty close. Then we sort of fine tune it just at the end. Well, this year, um, this year, what happened was Shelly and I got into it and we said, well, you know, what about if we add a little bit more of this and a little bit more of that? And, and it was like, well, this is like so not where we were the last time we blended. And we completely changed our blends. They were just yeah. changed. Before we bottled. Yeah, right. Yeah, literally. I mean, like That's days really before we bottled, blending. and it was like, holy, you know, everything is different now. It's completely different. But the interesting thing is, is that from the time that we last did our blending session till the time that we got ready to bottle, I, the wines actually had changed a fair amount. So um, we had we had different wines to be able to blend with, which is great. It turned out that we actually had some wines that, you know, in the final analysis, this is, this is where we wanted to be. And the reserve wine is something that, um, there's no format for it. There's, there's it, it's a free form wine. It's the wine that, you know, when we get down to the final blending, um, it's what I want it to be that day. And it's, much more akin this year to the left bank style blend that we've done because it's more cab predominant this year in this blend then last year the the strongest wine that i felt we had in the barrel at the last minute was the merlot so it was more of a right, right bank wine um so it was more pro merlot predominant this year the cabernet turned out to be the showpiece i think of the wines um and then you know we ended up with some really luscious petit Bordeaux and some luscious Cab Franc, and you know it was like, well, those would make really great additions at, at higher percentages than we're normally used to. So we ended up just rethinking the whole process, and you know, God only knows we bottled them, they're labeled. I mean, I I haven't had any of this since we did the blending on it, so I'm actually kind of anxious to sit down and. I pop a cork. We're probably going to do that tonight. <laughs> so the, the, the Merlot has a big dose of Cab Franc in it, right? They all have uh, more Cab Francs in it than more Cab Franc than we normally do. Normally, the Cab Franc and the Petit Verdot are, are minor players in it. Um, this year, they're much more uh, a pronounced player right. because the, the wines ended up, those two wines ended up being much more spectacular than, um, than, I, than I had anticipated. When we got down to the blending level. Does the Petit Verdot have a role on the left bank? It does. It also has a role, I mean, it has a role in all the wines. And, in the and again, you know, it's just, um, gosh darn. I have to go back to what. So, in the, 
In the left bank, the Petit Verdot is 15% of the final blend, and Cab Franc is five, which... It's you know, almost topsy-turvy. It's, it's very different. And then in the right bank, again, the Petit Verdot is 20%, and the Cab Franc is 15. In the reserve, the Petit Verdot is back at 15, and the Cab Franc is back down to five again. But that's just where we ended it up, and we, I mean, I have notes, I have right. notes of blends so, and where we wanted to be, yeah. and that's nowhere near where we started, nowhere near where we started. Um, you were saying something to me last week about the Sauvignon Blanc, you are saying that it wasn't, it wasn't ready to bottle, or it wasn't ready to, what were you saying, it was, it was wild. It was misbehaving. It was well, you know, at the at the at, again at the last minute, you're sitting there looking at the Sauvignon Blanc, and and um, we changed this year. Uh, last year, I liked the wine uh, a lot, but this year I wanted to sort of go a slightly different direction with it. Uh, some of it's in stainless steel, some of it's in oak. Last year it was all in oak. Um, so we're sitting there looking at the wine and and. It just needed a, a little bit more clarification, so we did some fining. We we're doing some fining exercises on it to get it to clarify just a little bit more. Um, I just, I just wanted to make sure that it was in perfect condition to be able to bottle. So it was, it was almost there. 